بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أود أن أتكلم هذه الليلة عن بعض القواعد الأساسية للصح في ضوء الهدي النبوي that I would like to speak to this evening about some of the basic principles of health in the light of prophetic guidance. إن الصحة من أجل نعم إن الصحة من أجل نعم الله على الإنسان. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث الصحيح الذي رواه البخاري وغيره نعمتان مغبون فيهما كثير من الناس الصحة والفراغ وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أول ما يسأل عنه العبد يوم القيامة من النعيم أن يقال له ألم نصح لك جسمك ونرويك من الماء البارد قال الله تعالى في خاتمة سورة التكاثر ثم لتسألن يومئذ عن النعيم وجاء عن بعض السلف الصالح وكثير من المفسرين أن هذا النعيم الذي نسأل عنه هو الصحة Health is among the greatest of all God's blessings upon the human being. The messenger of God, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, said in an authenticated narration transmitted by Bukhari and others, there are two great blessings about which many people are deceived, health and free time. The Prophet said, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace. The first thing that a person will be questioned about on the day of resurrection regarding God's great blessing upon him is that, is that it will be said to him, did we not make your body healthy for you and give you cold water to drink? God, exalted be he, says in the closing verse of Surah Al-Takathur, then you all surely shall be questioned on that day about the great blessing God bestowed upon you. And some of the Salaf and many of the commentators of the Qur'an have said that that great blessing about which we will be questioned is health. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في حديث حسن في حديث حسن رواه الترمذي وابن ماجة وغيرهما من أصبح معافا في جسده آمنا في سربه عنده قوت يومه فكأنما حيزت له الدنيا وجاء في الحديث الصحيح الذي رواه الترمذي وأحمد وغيرهما عن أبي بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول سلوا الله اليقين والمعافاة فما أوتي أحد بعد اليقين خيرا من العافية وفي رواية سلوا الله العفو والعافية والمعافاة فما أوتي أحد بعد اليقين خيرا من المعافاة فجمع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بين عافيتي الدين والدنيا والآخرة وهما اليقين والعافية فاليقين يدفع عن الإنسان عقوبات الآخرة والعافية تدفع عنه أمراض الدنيا في قلبه وبدنه وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في الرواية الثانية سلوا الله العفو والعافية والمعافاة فهذه الثلاثة التي هي من أصل لغوي واحد تتضمن إزالة الشرور الماضية بالعفو والشرور الحاضرة بالعافية والشرور المستقبلة بالمعافاة التي تفيد المداومة على العافية والاستمرار عليها The Messenger of God, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, said in a Hassan hadith, 
transmitted by Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and others. Whoever begins the day with full well-being in his body, security in his self, family, and possessions, and having with him his basic provision for the day, it is as if all the world had been gathered together for him as his own. It has come down to us in a Sahih Hadith transmitted by Tirmidhi, Ahmed, and others on the authority of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, may God be pleased with him that he said, I heard God's messenger, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, say, ask God for certainty of faith and fullness of well-being. For no one has ever been given after certainty of faith anything better than perfect health. In another transmission it is said, Ask God for pardon, perfect health, and fullness of well-being. For no one has ever been given after certainty of faith anything better than fullness of well-being. In the wording of these hadith, the messenger of God, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, join together the two principal types of well-being in the deen, this world, and the next certainty of faith and perfect health. Certainty of faith protects the human being from the punishments of the hereafter. Perfect well-being protects him from the sicknesses of this world that affect his heart and body. In the second transmission, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Ask God for pardon, perfect health, and fullness of well-being. Each of these words comes from a common Arabic root. They share a common meaning. They imply removing all past evils by divine pardon, al afr Removal of present evil through perfect health, al afiyah And removal of all future harms by fullness of well-being, which leads to continuity and preservation of perfect health. إِنَّ الصِّحَّةَ تَاجٌ عَلَى رُؤُوسِ الْأَصِحَّاءِ لَا يَرَاهُ إِلَّا الْمَرْضَى وَذَلِكَ لِأَنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْأَصِحَّاءِ فِي غَفْلَةٍ عَنْ نِعْمَةِ الصِّحَّةِ الَّتِي هُمْ فِيهَا بَلْ هِيَ نِعْمَةٌ مَغْبُونٌ فِيهَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ كَمَا جَاءَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ السَّابِقِ فَالْغَفْلَةُ النَّاشِئَةُ عن صحة الجسد هي بلاء عظيم وقد تؤدي في بعض الناس إلى الغفلة عن الله عز وجل وترك الصلاة والصيام وسائر العبادات والتمادي في الحرام وأسباب سخط الله تعالى والصحة التي تؤدي إلى الغفلة عن الله تعالى وحسن طاعته ليست بصحة في حقيقة الأمر بل هي بمثابة مرض عضال عظيم فالذنوب هي أمراض دائمة في الحياة الأبدية وهي في هذه الحياة الدنيا أمراض معنوية في القلب والوجدان والروح فينبغي أن يكون الإنسان عاقلا كيسا فلا يغتر بصحة جسده ولا يكون مغبونا فيها فالمرض المعنوي الناشئ عن الصحة الظاهرة مصيبة أكبر من المرض الذي يصيب الجسد فقط فالمصيبة حقا هي التي تصيب الإنسان في دينه وآخرته Health is a crown on the heads of healthy people which can only be seen by the sick this is because many healthy people are oblivious to the great blessing of the health they have been given. Indeed, as stated in the previously mentioned hadith, health is a great blessing about which many people are deceived. The state of negligence that often arises from having bodily health is, in fact, a great calamity. For some people, 
being in good physical health, may lead them to being oblivious to God, glorious and majestic be He, and to abandoning their daily prayers, fasting, and other types of worship. It may even lead to their reaching the furthest extent of doing what is forbidden and earning God's eternal wrath, exalted be He. Outward health that leads to neglectfulness of God, exalted be He, and of the proper obedience of Him is not actually health in terms of ultimate realities, rather it is an instance of great and chronic sickness. Sins, wrongful actions toward God and His creation will constitute perpetual sicknesses in the eternal life to come. In this world, they constitute non-physical, spiritual sicknesses in the heart, consciousness, and spirit. Thus, each human being should use his intellect and behave intelligently. He should not be led astray by the outward health of his body and be deceived by it. The non-physical spiritual sickness that arises from outward health is a much greater affliction than the physical sickness that afflicts the body alone. For the greatest affliction in truth is that which befalls a human being and affects his religion and his afterlife. فَلَيْسَتْ صِحَّةُ الْجَسَدِ الظَّاهِرَةُ خَيْرًا مُطْلَقًا كَمَا يَزْعُمُ كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ بَلِ الْخَيْرُ الْمُطْلَقُ هُوَ فِي الْجَمْعِ بَيْنَ صِحَّتَيِّ الْجَسَدِ وَالْقَلْبِ وَهُوَ الْمُرَادُ بِالْعَرَبِيَّةِ وَالْأَحَادِيثِ السَّابِقَةِ بِالْعَافِيَّةِ وَالْمُعَافَاءِ فَهُمَا عِبَارَةٌ عَنِ الصِّحَّةِ التَّامَّةِ التي فيها البراءة من جميع العلل والبلايا الظاهرة والباطنة ومنها السلامة من الغفلة عن الله تعالى والدين فليست كل صحة نعمة بل بعدها نقمة وكذلك ليس كل مرض نقمة بل بعده نعمة على خلاف ما, ل... ما يتصوره كثير من البشر قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كما روى البخاري من يريد الله به خيرا يسب منه فما... فمرض المؤمن الصابر هو من هذا الخير الذي أراده الله له وهو نوع من الإحسان الإلهي للمؤمن فمرض المؤمن يطهره من الأدران ويمسح عنه الذنوب وينقيه من الخطايا فلا ينبغي للمؤمن الشكوى من المرض لأن الشكوى بلاء في بلاء بل يجب عليه التبصر والصبر والشكر وأن يجعل مرضه عبادة لله تعالى قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما رواه البخاري ومسلم ما من مسلم يصيبه أذى إلا حات الله عنه خطاياه كما تحات ورق الشجر وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما رواه البخاري إذا مرض العبد أو سافر كتب الله تعالى له من الأجر مثل ما كان يعمل صحيحا مقيما Outward physical health of the body is not an absolute good contrary to what many people today think Absolute good in health comes when the physical health of the body is joined to the spiritual health of the heart In Arabic and in the preceding hadith this is what is meant by afia, perfect health, and mu'afa, fullness of well-being. Both words stand for a complete fullness of health in which we are free of all outward and inward diseases and afflictions. These qualities protect us, among other things, from being oblivious to God, exalted be He, and true religion. 
Thus, not every instance of physical health is a blessing. On the contrary, some instances of outward health are a sickness and a curse. Likewise, not every type of physical sickness is a curse. Rather, some instances of physical sickness are a blessing, contrary to what many people imagine. The Messenger of God, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, said in a transmission by Al-Bukhari, whomever God wills good for, he allots him some affliction. The physical sickness of the patient believer is an example of this divine good God wills for him. It is an instance of the kindly goodness, the ihsan of God that he bestows upon the believer and the gift of infinite mercy he gives to him. The physical sickness of the believer purifies him from impurities. It wipes away his sins and cleanses him of all wrongdoings. Thus, the believer should never complain of physical sickness. Making such complaints adds an additional and a, gr and a greater affliction to the affliction one already has. Rather, it is obligatory to look upon sickness with understanding, to be patient, to be thankful, and to convert one's sickness into a special type of worship. For God exalted be He. God's Messenger, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, said in a hadith transmitted by Bukhari and Muslim, there is no Muslim who is afflicted by harm, but that God strips him bare of all his wrongdoings, like the leaves are stripped bare of a tree. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said in another transmission from Al-Bukhari, if the servant of God gets sick, or travels, God writes down for him of his reward the likes of what he used to do when he was healthy and at home. فَمِنْ أَوَّلِ الْقَوَاعِدِ الْأَسَاسِيَةِ لِلصِّحَّةِ فِي ضَوْءِ الْهَدْيِ النَّبَوِي أَنَّ مَثْهُومَ كُلٍ مِنَ الصِّحَّةِ وَالْمَرَضِ يَخْتَلِفُ عَنْ مَثْهُومَيْهِمَا فِي الْمَنْظُورِ فِي الْمَنْظُورِ الْمَادِّي الَّذِي يُسَيْطِرُ عَلَى أذهان كثير من الناس اليوم فصحة الجسد مصيبة ومرض إن لم تكن مسحوبة بصحة القلب والضمير والروح كما أن مرض المؤمن الصابر المحتسب الشاكر تعتبر صحة له بل يغد المرض في حق بعض المؤمنين كنزا عظيما لهم فأمر المؤمن كله خير كما ثبت عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وقد تلقى نبي الله أيوب وغيره من الأنبياء عليهم السلام أمراضهم عبادة خالصة لله تعالى والعبادة الخالصة بالمرض في حق كل مؤمن صابر بصير هي عبادة زكية لا يدخل فيها الرياء فالمرض يقوم في حق المؤمن بدور المرشد الناصح الأمين الموقظ فهو كفارة للذنوب والمعاصي وهو يدفع الغفلة وهو بذلك هدية إلهية ثمينة للمؤمن وتنبيه رحماني وإيقاظ رباني له وقد يفوز المريض المؤمن الصابر البصير خلال عشرين يوما من المرض بما قد يستعصي استحصاله خلال عشرين سنة كاملة من العبادة في حالة صحة الجسد Thus, among the first basic principles of health in the light of prophetic guidance is that the understanding of what constitutes health and sickness is different from how they are understood from the standpoint of the materialism <clears throat> that dominates the minds of many people today. Health of the physical body is a calamity and constitutes sickness 
whenever it is not accompanied with the health of the heart, conscience, and the spirit. Likewise, the physical sickness of the patient believer who seeks God, God's reward and is thankful counts as a type of good health for him. Indeed, it is the great attainment of some believers that the sicknesses from which they suffer are transformed into immense treasures for them. Everything that transpires in the believer's life, both benefit and harm, are ultimately good, as has been firmly established on the authority of God's messenger. May God extol him and grant him perfect peace. God's prophet Job and all the other prophets, peace be upon them, received the sicknesses with which they were afflicted as special types of pure, unblemished worship of God. Exalted be he. This pure, unblemished worship that comes about by virtue of sickness in the case of every patient and insightful believer is a type of pure, untarnished worship in which the hypocrisy of show has no place. In the case of the believer, sickness plays the role of a trustworthy spiritual guide who gives sincere counsel and wakes us up from negligence. Sickness is an atonement for wrongdoings and acts of disobedience. It removes our negligence and is a precious divine gift for the believer and an infinite divine mercy and lordly gift that wakes him up and calls him to attention. It may often be that the patient and insightful believer who is afflicted with illness gains much greater benefit in 20 days of sickness than he could possibly attain during 20 full years of worship in a state of good physical health. كما سبق مثل ما يستحيل الفحم في بطن الأرض تحت الضغط الشديد الطويل والحرارة البالغة إلى حجر الألماس الذي هو من أصفى أنواع الحجر وأكثرها لمعانا وأشدها صلابة وأنفسها قيمة والمعلوم أنه كان من هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فعل التداوي في نفسه والأمر به لمن أصابه مرض من أهله وأصحابه وأصبح الطب في الشريعة النبوية من أشرف الحرف وتعتبر من أنفعها للبشر وعرف الطب في الإسلام بفقه الأبدان روى الإمام مالك رضي الله عنه في كتابه الموطة أن رجلين من الصحابة سأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أو في الطب خير يا رسول الله فقال أنزل الدواء الذي أنزل الداء وروى مسلم وأحمد وغيرهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لكل داء دواء فإذا أصيب دواء الداء برئ بإذن الله عز وجل وروى البخاري وابن ماجة وغيرهما أن النبي عليه السلام قال ما أنزل الله من داء إلا أنزل له الشفاء وفي رواية صحيحة لأحمد وغيره إن الله عز وجل لم ينزل داء إلا أنزل له شفاء علمه من علمه وجهله من جهله Despite all this, the blessing of sickness, our prophet's guidance, peace be upon him, 
does not welcome sickness or regard it to be desirable. Sickness is a state of weakness and deficiency that perverts our nature and removes from us our normal parameters and removes us from the normal parameters of balance and action. Sickness is an instance of harm and affliction. Yet, if the believer is afflicted by this harm, then he does not complain or break down before it. Rather, as indicated, he seeks to transform it into a special and unique type of worship and a great treasure, just as coal in the depths of the earth under powerful and enduring pressure and intense heat is transformed into a diamond which is among the purest and most brilliant of all stones, the hardest of all minerals, and the most valued of them in price. Yet it is also a well-known tenet <clears throat> that um, it is also well known that the act of treating diseases with medicine is part of the guidance of God's messenger. May God extol him and grant him perfect peace. He availed himself of medicinal cures and commanded members of his, families, of his family and his companions to do so also when they were afflicted by sickness. In the prophetic law, the blessed Sharia, medicine became one of the most honorable of all professions and was rightfully regarded as beneficial to humankind. It became known in Islam as fiqh al-abdan, the great law relating to our bodies. Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, transmits in the Muwatta that two among his, the Prophet's companions asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, is there truly any good in medicine? O Messenger of God, the Prophet answered, every disease has a remedy. If the remedy of the disease is appropriate, the person will be healed by the permission of God, powerful and majestic be he. Bukhari, Ibn Majah, and others transmit that the Prophet wasallam said, God never sends down a type of sickness, but that he sends down a cure for it. In another authenticated transmission by Imam Ahmed and others, the Prophet said, peace be upon him, certainly God, powerful and majestic be he, has not sent down a disease, but that he has sent down for it a cure. Whoever knows it, knows it well. And whoever is ignorant of it, is ignorant of it. Even دلت أحاديث نبوية صحيحة كثيرة على أن التداوية من هدي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنه لا تنافي بين الطب والتداوي وبين التوكل على الله تعالى بل من حقيقة التوحيد مباشرة الأسباب التي نصبها الله مقتضيات لمسبباتها قدرا وشرعا فلا ينبغي أن يجعل الإنسان أن يجعل الإنسان عجزه توكلا كما أنه لا ينبغي أن يجعل توكله عجزا ولكن يجب أن يعلم المؤمن يقينا أن الله الذي أنزل الداء والدواء هو الشافي وحده وبأن الشفاء وحسن تأثير الدواء لا يكونان إلا من الله الحق تبارك وتعالى كما ورد في الحديث السابق فإذا أصيب دواء الداء برئ بإذن الله عز وجل وقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم لكل داء دواء فيه تقوية لنفس المريض والطبيب معا وحث على طلب ذلك الدواء الذي أنزله الله والتفتيش عليه وهو يبعث في المريض والطبيب روح الرجاء التي هي من أكبر أسباب التشفي ويحفظهما من حرارة اليأس 
ويجب أن نلاحظ أيضا أن الدواء قد لا يكون شيئا واحدا وقد لا يكون شيئا ملموسا وقد لا يكون مما نسميه دواء في عرفنا المتداول بيننا بل قد يكون عدة أمور أخرى الصدقة وحسن الظن بالله والدعاء والذكر أو آية, آية من القرآن الكريم أو سورة Many authenticated prophetic hadith show clearly that taking remedies and using medicine are part of the guidance of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that there is no contradiction between medicine and remedies, between medicine and taking remedies and reliance upon God, exalted be He. On the contrary, the reality of Tawheed, belief in the absolute oneness of God, is that we make full use of the secondary causes, asbab, in nature that God has established as a means to certain ends by divine decree and creation and through prophetic law. Thus, no one has the excuse to portray his incompetence as tawakkul or to make his tawakkul an excuse for incompetence. But it is obligatory that the believer know with certainty that God who has sent down the disease and its remedy, he alone is the shafi, he alone is the healer, he alone is the dispenser of the cure. We must also remember that being cured and receiving the excellent effect of the medicine we use only occurs by the grace of God, the real, blessed, and exalted be He, as was transmitted in the preceding hadith. If the remedy of the disease is appropriate, the person will get well by the permission of God, powerful and majestic be He. Moreover, the Prophet saying, peace be upon him, for every disease there is a remedy, is also meant to empower and strengthen the heart of both the sick person and the physician as well. It urges both of them to look carefully for the cure that God has sent down. In both the sick person and the doctor alike, it arouses the spirit of hopefulness which is one of the greatest means of finding the cure, and it protects them both from the agony and desperation of despair. It is also important to note that the remedy that God sends down need not be a single thing or a tangible thing, but may be a combination of many. And it, and it need not be medicine per se in the sense that we customarily use the word. It may be, for example, intangible things such as charity, having a good opinion of God, exalted be He, making dua, doing dhikr, or reciting verses or surahs of the Holy Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa min al jadiri bi dhikri huna. An nuakid al dawr al qalb al salimi fi al sahati wa al tashafi min al amradi. Wa qad la hazna min qablu. أن صحة الجسد لا تعتبر صحة إن لم تكن مسحوبة بسلامة القلب بل هي نوع من أنواع المرض ومن قواعد الطب النبوي أن أمراض الأبدان على وزان أمراض القلوب وأمراض القلوب نوعان مرض شبهة وشك ومرض شهوة وغير فالقلب المؤمن القوي من أكبر أسباب الصحة إن روح المؤمن متى قويت وقويت معها النفس والطبيعة تعاونا على دفع الداء وقهره وها هنا من الأدوية القلبية والروحانية التي تشفي من الأمراض ما لم يهتدي إليه أقول كثير من أكابر الأطباء ولم تصل إليها علومهم وتجاربهم وأقيستهم فقوة قلب المؤمن واعتماده على الله تعالى وتوكله عليه والالتجاء إليه والصدقة والصلاة 
والدعاء والتوبة والاستغفار والإحسان إلى الخلق وإغاثة الملهوف والتفريج عن المكروب ليست قربات إلى الله تعالى فحسب بل هي أدوية قلبية أيضا وهي من أكبر أسباب الشفاء ودوام العافية وعقلاء الأطباء قديما وحديثا معترفون بأن في فعل القوى النفسية وانفعالاتها في شفاء الأمراض عجائب وأكثر أسباب تسلط الخبث على أهله والأمراض المتسبب عن ذلك هو من جهة قلة دينهم وخراب قلوبهم وألسنتهم من حقائق الذكر والتعاويذ والتحصنات النبوية الإيمانية فالقلب, فالقلب إذا كان ممتلئا بالإيمان بالله مغمورا بذكره وله من التوجهات والدعوات والأذكار والتعوذات ورد لا يخل به يطابق فيه قلبه لسانه كان هذا من أعظم الأسباب التي تديم العفو والعافية والمعافاة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة والتي تمنع من إصابة الشر كما أنها من أعظم العلاجات للمؤمن بعدما يصيبه البلاء والأذى ومن أكبر مصائب هذا الزمان زندقة كثير من الأطباء والمرضى الذين لا يعرفون هذه الحقائق وينظرون إلى الصناعة الطبية من منظور مادي فقط وهم أسقم الناس وهم أشدهم مرضا It is appropriate here that we mention again and emphasize the dynamic role of the sound heart in health and in being cured from various sicknesses once they occur. We noted before that the physical health of the body is not regarded as true health unless it is accompanied by the inward soundness of the heart. On the contrary, such merely outward health is itself a type of chronic disease. One of the basic principles of prophetic medicine is that all the sicknesses that afflict our bodies are in accord with the sicknesses that affect our hearts. The sicknesses of the heart are of two basic types, sicknesses that arouse from dubious and doubtful misconceptions and false beliefs, and sicknesses that arouse from unrestrained appetite and passion and erroneous ways of living that come from ignorance and false understanding. The strong believing heart is one of the greatest secrets of good health. When the believer's spirit becomes strong and his soul and physical nature become powerful, in conjunction with it, they work together in repelling disease and holding it at bay. There are indeed remedies and medicines of the heart and spirit that cure sicknesses in a manner that some of the greatest physicians have never been guided to discover. Such spiritual cures have not been incorporated into their science, clinical experience, or manner of thinking. The power of the believer's heart, his utter dependence and reliance upon God, and his taking refuge in God, have miraculous curing effects. This is true also of sadaqa, giving charity, performing the five daily prayers, making dua, turning back to Allah in tawbah and asking his forgiveness. It applies to being kind to others, coming to the aid of those in great need, and removing the sufferings of those who live in affliction. All of these are remedies. These are not just acts of drawing near God alone. Rather, they are medicines of the heart and are among the greatest and most effective means of being cured from illness and being able to maintain the gifts of divine pardon, perfect health, and fullness of well-being. 
The physicians of great intellect in past and present times acknowledge that amazing miracles arise from the powers of the soul and its spiritual reactions when it comes to healing ourselves from sickness. The major reasons that bring about the domination of impure and unhealthy states upon people and the various sicknesses that result from them come about by virtue of lack of religiosity, deen, the state of the ruin of our hearts and our tongues when there is no place left on them for the ultimate realities of dhikr, the supplications of divine protection, dua, and spiritual fortresses, husun, of protection from, taken from prophetic teaching and true belief. When the believer's heart is filled with belief in God and immersed in his remembrance, dhikr, when the believer is continually turning toward God, making supplications, different types of remembrance, and seeking refuge in him, and this becomes a wird, a daily spiritual exercise that he never abandons, and in which his heart is in unison with his tongue. This becomes one of the greatest of all secrets that keep us in a state of divine pardon, perfect health, afia, and fullness of well-being, mu'afa. In this deen, the world, and the hereafter, these spiritual exercises ward off from us evil in the form of various afflictions and types of sickness. And they constitute some of the greatest treatments for the believer once he is struck by calamity and affliction. Among the greatest calamities of our time is the atheism and materialist heresy of many physicians and many sick people as well who are unacquainted with these spiritual realities and look upon the practice of medicine from a strictly materialist perspective. These are in fact the most diseased and chronically sick of all people. Awaddu an akhtima hadha al-bahth bi dhikri qawa'id al-sihhat al-asasiyyati al-thalath fi dawi al-hadi al-nabawi wa bil jumla fa inna min ahammi ma yulahadu an hadhi al-qawa'id wal qawa'id allati qad sabaqa bayanuha fi hadha al-bahth أن صحتك ليست بأمر يخص الأطباء الأطباء والعيادات والصيدليات والمستشفيات فقط، بل هو أمر يخصك أنت في حياتك اليومية، فلا بد من أن تشترك كل يوم في أسباب صحتك ودوام العفو والعافية والمعافاة، فلا تكن معينا على نفسك. باعتياد العادات المضرة للصحة أما قواعد طب الأبدان الثلاث بضوء الهدي النبوي فهي واحدا حفظ الصحة الموجودة ثانيا الحمية عن المؤذي وثالثا استفراغ المواد الفاسدة ويقال إن مدار الطب كله I would like to conclude this presentation by mentioning the three basic principles of good health in the light of prophetic guidance. In general, among the most important observations to be made about these principles and the principles that we have already clarified in this presentation is that your health is not just a matter that concerns doctors, clinics, pharmacies, and hospitals. Your health is a matter that concerns no one more than it concerns you, and it depends on the way you live your life day by day. You must be an active participant in your health every day. You must make it a habit to do those things that support your health, and lead to continued divine pardon, afu, perfect health, afia, and fullness of well-being, mu'afa. Do not be your own worst enemy. 
Do not work against yourself by adopting habits and customs that are harmful to your health. The three principles of good medicine in the light of prophetic garden of guidance for our bodies are one, preserve the health you have. Two, protect yourself from what is harmful to you. Three, detoxify yourself from or remove from your body all toxins and harmful elements which you have consumed or been exposed to. It is said that in the Islamic tradition, all sound medicine revolves around these three simple principles. والمسكن والهواء والنوم واليقظة والحركة والسكون وغير ذلك على الوجه على الوجه المعتدل الموافق الملائم للبدن والبلد والسن والعادة وعلى رأس ذلك تدبير المطعم والمشرب والإرشاد في ذلك كله في قوله تعالى وكلوا واشربوا ولا تسرفوا وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما معناه فليأكل في ثلث بطنه وليدع الثلث الآخر للماء والثالث للنفس ويقال إن حسن الخلق مبدأه في البطن أي في آداب الأكل والشراب وأساليبه وحسن تدبير المطعم والمشرب ينفع القلب كما أن الإسراف في الأكل والشراب يفسد القلب ويكسل الجوارح ويحرك الشهوات المهلكة فينبغي أن يكون المطعم والمشرب بالقدر الذي ينتفع به البدن في الكمية والكيفية فمتى جاوز ذلك كان إسرافا مانعا من الصحة وجالبا للداء والمأكلات والمشروبات الطبيعية المنتوجة في البلد غير المصنوعة والمستوردة هي الأنفع في الغالب فمثلا الحليب الطازج الغير المبستر نافع جدا للصحة ما دامت البقر ترعى وتحلب بطريقة طبيعية نظيفة وللتسمية في أول الطعام والشراب وحمد الله في آخره تأثير عجيب في نفعه واستمرائه ودفع مضرته قال الإمام أحمد رضي الله عنه إذا جمع الطعام أربعا فقد كمل فقد كمل إذا ذكر اسم الله في أوله وحمد الله في آخره وكثرت عليه الأيدي وكان من حلو والرياضة المعتدلة من أكبر أسباب الحفاظ على الصحة أيضا والكسل وقلة الحركة من الأسباب الجالبة للأمراض as for preserving the health we have, the guidance of God's messenger, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, calls for sound management of the way we eat and drink, the clothing that we wear, the places where we live. It directs us to take fresh air, to maintain the right amounts of sleep and wakefulness, and to be active while getting adequate rest also. And it also indicates for us other types of healthy behavior as long as they are done in a manner that is moderate, properly balanced, measured and suitable and appropriate to our bodies, the lands where we live, our ages and the customs practiced around us. Among the most important of all these matters is the proper management of what we eat and drink. The basics of right guidance in all of this are indicated in the Qur'anic verse and eat and drink 
but do not go to excess. The messenger of God, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, also directed us in this regard by saying, so let the believer eat enough to fill one third of his stomach. Let him leave the second third for water and the last third for his breath. It is also said that good character begins in the stomach, that is in the proper courtesies of how we eat and drink. Proper management of food and drink also benefits the heart just as excessiveness in food and drink harms the heart, makes the limbs of the body lazy, and stimulates in us harmful passions and appetites. Thus, what we eat and drink ought to be in proportion to what benefits our bodies in quantity and quality. Whatever goes beyond that, proportion constitutes excess. It endangers our health and brings about sickness. Natural organic foods and drinks produced locally in our countries and that are not manufactured or imported are generally the most beneficial. For example, raw natural milk that has not been pasteurized is very beneficial for the health as long as the cows graze and are milked in a clean and natural manner. Mentioning God's name, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, when we begin or finish to eat and drink, also has an amazing effect as regards making what we consume beneficial, delicious, and protecting us from harm. Imam Ahmed, may Allah be pleased with him, said, if four elements come together in our food, then it is as perfect as it can be. When God's name is mentioned at its beginning, when God's praise is given at its end, when many hands partake in consuming it, and when it is pure and lawful. Moderate exercise is also one of the greatest means of preserving health. Laziness and inactivity are among those bad habits that bring sickness and disease. أَمَّا الْقَاعِدَةُ الثَّانِيَةُ وَهِيَ الْحِمْيَةُ عَنِ الْمُؤْذِي فَقَدْ وَرَدَ فِي الْأَثَرِ الْمَشْهُورِ الْحِمْيَةُ رَأْسُ الدَّوَاءِ وَالْمَاعِدَةُ بَيْتُ الدَّاءِ وَعَوِّدُ كُلَّ جِسْمٍ مَعْتَادٍ وَلَيْسَ هَذَا الْأَثَرُ بِحَدِيثِ النَّبَوِي وَإِنَّمَا هُوَ مَأْثُورٌ عَنِ الْحَارِثِ بْنِ كَلَدَةِ الَّذِي زَامَنَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَالْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ رضي الله عنه وعرف الحارث بطبيب العربي في عصره ومعنى هذا الأثر الصحيح وهو ممتلئ بالحكمة وبالجملة فإن الحمية من أنفع الأدوية قبل الداء فتمنع حصوله وإذا حصل فتمنع, الحم فتمنع تزايده وانتشاره وأكثر الأمراض تتولد من سوء الاستعمال للطعام والشراب وعدم الحمية وإهمال الإرشاد مع الإسراف والسفاهة وعدم الحذر وكثرة الذنوب. As for the second basic principle of good health, protecting ourselves from what is harmful, the well-known report has come down to us, protection from what is harmful is the summit of all remedies. The stomach is the house where sickness lives, where sickness is born and lives. Give each body what it is accustomed to. This well-known Islamic teaching is not a prophetic hadith, as many people assume, but has come down to us from Al-Harith ibn Kalada who was a contemporary of the Prophet وسلم, and the rightly guided caliphs عنهم, in his time Al-Harith was known as the physician of the Arabs. The meaning of this report is valid and it is filled with wisdom. In general, protecting ourselves from what is harmful is the most beneficial of all remedies 
before sickness occurs and it wards off sickness as long as that happens. When sickness does occur, practice of this principle keeps it from increasing and spreading. Most sicknesses are born from misuse of food and drink and failure to protect ourselves from what is harmful. Many sicknesses arise also from failure to follow sound medical advice in conjunction to excessiveness, foolishness, failure to take precautions, and, many, and, the, and the many sins that we commit. ومن أخطر العادات السيئة التي يجب على العاقل أن يجنبها حمية لصحته التدخين وينبغي الحذر كل الحذر من تناول الشياطين البيض أي السكر والملح والدقيق البيضاء المسنوعة ولعل أكثر الأمراض التي تصيب الناس في الجنبية هي من التدخين والإسراف في السكر والملح والخبز المطبوخ من الدقيق الأبيض ويجب أن نعود هنا إلى المبدأ الذي هو أن الأطعمة والأشربة الطبيعية المنتوجة في البلد هي الأنفع في الغالب فينبغي الإقلال من المستوردات والمنتوجات المسنوعة فالرز الطبيعي المزروع في هذا البلد أنفع بكثير من الرز الأبيض المستورد والخبز الطبيعي المطبوخ من الدقيق الطبيعي المتكامل أكثر فائدة من الخبز الأبيض المسنوع ومن باب الحمية أيضا أنه ينبغي الحذر من حبس البول والغائط والقي والعطاس ومن أهم أسس الحمية في ضوء الهدي النبوي عدم إدخال طعام جديد على البدن قبل هضم الأول فالفواكه تنهضم بسرعة غالبا حوالي نصف ساعة مع أن اللحوم والأطعمة الثقيلة تحتاج إلى وقت طويل وقد لا تنهضم إلا بعد ثلاث ساعات والمبدأ هنا أن تأكل عن جوع وتشرب عن عطش ولا تفرط فيجب الحذر من الزيادة على القدر الذي تحتاج إليه البدن وعدم تناول الأغذية الرديئة, الرديئة والقليلة النفع ومن أسس الصحة في الإسلام الحكمة المأثورة كل كثير فهو معاد للطبيعة وكذلك الإقلال من الضار خير من الإكثار من النافع Among the most dangerous of bad habits that the, peop, that, that the person of intellect must strictly avoid is to protect the body from smoking we must also beware of consuming the three white doubles, white refined sugar, salt, and flour. It seems on the basis of our experience that most sicknesses that afflict the Gambian people come from smoking and excessive use of sugar, salt, and bread made of white refined flour. Here again, it is useful to come back to the principle mentioned before. The foods and drinks locally produced in your country are generally the most beneficial for your health, and we must make as little use as possible of imported foods and drinks and the products of the food industry. For example, natural whole rice grown here in this blessed country locally is much more beneficial as a rule than white imported rice. Natural bread baked from whole organic flour is much more beneficial than white refined bread. It is also part of the principle of protecting ourselves from what is harmful to our health to avoid holding back urine, feces, vomit, and even sneezing.
When you have to sneeze, you sneeze. Among the most important principles of self-protection in health, in the light of prophetic guidance, is to avoid eating new food as long as our bodies have not yet digested the food we just ate. Fruits, for example, usually digest quickly. As a rule, they may not take more than 30 minutes. Meats and heavy foods, on the other hand, take a much longer time to digest, often as much as three hours. In such cases, the healthiest principle to follow is to eat when you are truly hungry and drink when you are truly thirsty without going to excess. It is also important to avoid with care consuming more than your body needs or consuming low quality food and drink that are of little or no benefit. Among the foundations of good health in Islam handed down from the ancients of old are the words of wisdom. Everything consumed in overabundance is harmful to your nature. Likewise, it is said, to consume a small amount of what is harmful is better than consuming an overabundance of what is beneficial. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi ma rawahu al-Bukhari wa Muslim la yuridanna mumridun ala musah wa hadihi qa'idatun kubra fi al-himyati min al-mu'thi tadhafala anhu kathirun min al-muslimin al-yawm wa laha tatbiqun mashhurun fi halati al-ta'un qala al-nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi al-bukhari wa muslim wa al-muwatta wa al-tirmidhi wa ghayrihim al-ta'un rijsun ursil ala ta'ifatin min bani israel wa ala man kana qablakum fa idha sami'tum bihi bi ardin fala tadkhulu alayhi wa idha waqa'a bi ardin wa antum biha fala takhruju minha firaran minhu wa jaa'a fi al-bukhari wa muslim at-ta'un shahadatun li kulli muslim wa jaa'a anhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi riwayatin sahiha المقيم به أي الطاعون كالشهيد والفار منه كالفار من الزحف ويجب أن نلاحظ أن كل طاعون وباء وليس كل وليس كل وباء بطاعون ومع ذلك فإن أحكام الوباء على قياس بأحكام الطاعون كمثل الإبولة الذي أصاب بعض القرى وأحياء بعض المدن في مناطق من إفريقيا الغربية اليوم نسأل الله تعالى لنا ولهم الحماية منه ومن المهم أنه لم يقل أحد من فقهاء المسلمين وأطبائهم إنه يجب على الناس في وقت الطاعون أو الوباء أن يتركوا حركاتهم بالكلية فيسير بمنزلة الجمادات وإنما ينبغي فيها التقلل من حركات الناس العادية ويجب التركيز على حركات أمثال الأطباء والممرضين وأصحاب المهن الضرورية في سبيل البحث على علاج عام والعودة إلى حيز السلامة The Messenger of God May God extol him and grant him perfect peace, said, as transmitted by Bukhari and Muslim, the person who has become sick must never place himself in the presence of the person in good health. This hadith enunciates a major principle pertaining to protecting our health from harmful influences, although many Muslims today live in complete negligence of it. This foundation of public health has a famous application in the case of plagues. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, as transmitted by Bukhari, Muslim, the Muwatta of Imam Malik, Tirmidhi, and elsewhere, the plague is a foul impurity, ridis, that was sent down upon a group of the children of Israel and those who were before you. If you hear word of its appearance in a land, 
then do not enter upon it in that land. And if it occurs in a land where you are living, then do not leave that land fleeing from it. That is the plague. Al-Bukhari and Muslim also transmit, death by the plague constitutes holy martyrdom for every Muslim. It has been transmitted in another authenticated hadith. The person who stays where he is in the presence of the plague is like the holy martyr. <coughs> the person who flees from it to another land is like the person who turns and flees in the line of Babel. We must note that every plague is an epidemic, but not every epidemic is a plague. Despite that, the Islamic rulings pertaining to epidemics are based on analogy with the plague, such as, for example, the Ebola epidemic, which is presently affecting certain villages and city quarters in parts of West Africa. We ask God for ourselves and our brothers and sisters that he protect them and all of us from this epidemic. It is also very important that no Muslim faqih or physician has ever held that it is the obligation of the people during plagues and epidemics to stop completely all movements and activities and become like inanimate objects that cannot move or act. No one has ever said that. <clears throat> Rather, what is required in plagues and epidemics is that people bring to a minimum their customary activities and movements while focusing on the mo movements and activities of people such as doctors, nurses, and those who provide essential social services seeking a general cure for all and the return to a healthy state. وَأَمَّا الْقَاعِدَةُ الثَّارِثَةُ وَنَنْتَهِ هُنَا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَأَمَّا الْقَاعِدَةُ الثَّارِثَةُ مِنْ أَرْكَانِ الطِّبِّ النَّبَوِي وَهِيَ اسْتِفْرَاغُ الْمَوَادِّ الْفَاسِدَةِ فَهِيَ بَابٌ وَاسِعٌ تَعَلَّقَ أَكْثَرُهُ بِدَوْرِ الطَّبِيبِ فَلَنْ نُطَوِّلُ الْحَدِيثَ الْآنَ فِي بَيَانِهِ وَلَكِنْ نُلَاحِظُ أَنَّ مِنْ أَهَمِّ أُسُسِ اسْتِفْرَاغِ الْمَوَادِّ الْفَاسِدَةِ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ الصِّيَامُ الْمَشْرُوعُ وَلَا سِيَمَ صِيَامُ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ الْمُبَارَكِ وجاء في الأثر المشهور صوم كالصحر والتمسك بسنة المسواك والتنظيف الأسنان يوميا أيضا من السور الأساسية لاستفراغ المواد الفاسدة من الفم والجسد ومن عجائب سنة المسواك أن المسواك لا ينظف الفم والأسنان واللثث فقط بل هو ينفع العينين والدماغ وينظفهما أيضا وفي خاتمة هذا البحث بعد شكركم على حسن استماعكم فقد تبين أن المريض هو غالبا الذي يعين على نفسه فتعلم هذه القواعد الأساسية للصحة في ضوء الهدي النبوي وكن مشتركا فعالا ومعينا حكيما على سلامة نفسك وكن بذلك خادما للطبيعة التي ركبها الله في نفسك ولا تكن معيقا لها وإذا ابتليت بالمرض فتقبله بالحكمة والبصيرة والصبر والشكر وحوله إلى عبادة خالصة لله تعالى وقال بعض السلف الصالح لولا مصائب الدنيا لوردنا القيامة مثاليس As for the third basic principle of prophetic medicine and we will conclude here and I thank you very much for your patience in listening uh, it is as you know removing toxins and harmful elements from our bodies. It constitutes a vast treasury of wisdoms and prophetic medicine, most of which, however, pertain directly to the role of the physician. So we will not go into length expanding on this principle right now. But it is important to note 
that one of the most important applications of this principle of purification from toxins is there in the religion of Islam in the institution of fasting as set forth in the prophetic law especially the blessed annual fast of the month of Ramadan. It has come down to us in a well-known aphorism, fast and be healthy. Holding to the sunnah of the miswak, the, the tooth stick, and cleaning our mouths and teeth on a regular basis also belongs under this important heading. One of the amazing things about the sunnah of the miswak is that it does not just clean the mouth, teeth, and gums, but it also is very beneficial to our eyesight and our brains and cleans them indirectly as well. In concluding this presentation, I hope it has become clear that usually the sick person has played the role of his own worst enemy and facilitated his sickness. Please learn these fundamentals of good health in the light of prophetic guidance and take an active, dynamic role in preserving your health and aiding yourself wisely to enjoy a state of lasting well-being. If and when, however, you are afflicted by sickness, may God protect us all, then accept it with wisdom, insight, patience, and thankfulness. Transform it into a state of pure and unique worship of God. Some of the upright salaf of the first generations of Islam would say, if it were not for the afflictions that overtake us in this world, we would come back to God on the day of resurrection completely bankrupt. Shukran wassalamu alaykum.